Thank you very much. It's been great to meet some of you at lunchtime today because I'm a customer. I'm a buyer. I've got uh, business cards uh, in my pocket from Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, from France, because I'm a buyer of your services. I advise large corporations on digital marketing strategies. I have commissioned a website for 10 million pounds and built it with 150 people. I'm in that kind of world. I also am a customer because I have my own blog. I have a website. My own blog has had 15 million users. I have had five million, five and a half million video views on YouTube. I, uh, and this is natural search that drives that traffic. So I'm in your world. I enjoy your world. A friend of mine started a company just like one of yours, but he's not a partner. He's gone on and done other things now. He created it at the age of 18. He sold it out at the age of 21, and he's doing other things. Well, this is an exciting space. It is an exciting area. But I want to talk to you also about being a customer as a human being. Because actually we haven't heard quite so much about the customer as a human being today. And we need to do that because actually that's what it's all about. I want to put the whole of what you are doing, you are the world experts on digital marketing. I can't possibly tell you anything that you don't know about digital marketing. But what I want to do is to take you on a journey into the future and in the process of which I believe we will begin to see some things in a new way. So my, my title really is this, how do we create magic for our customers? Not how do we get them to click through, not how do we get them to buy product, or how do we get them to view pages, who cares? But how do we create magic? Magic for your corporate customers. I was talking to some of you today, you're telling me a huge problem is your customers don't get it. Your big corporate customers are stuck in a last century pre-digital time warp, right? And part of your whole job is consulting with them, helping, dragging them into the third millennium. And on the other hand, you've got the customers who are in mobile, multi-channel, omni-whatever, and they're rushing out the door away from all the kind of pay-per-click stuff we've done for so many years, with, the, with your buying customer over here, and the people they're trying to reach over there, and you're stuck in the middle somewhere, trying to join them together to make the transition. So it's a challenge. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to rehearse all the things you've heard about today, and you're going to have all kinds of exciting things tomorrow. But my question is this. See, there's one word which will drive the future of your business more than any other. It has driven the last 300 years of human history. This word is more important than economics, more important than innovation, more important than digital, more important than, uh, than uh, our communication. It's more important than, than, the, uh, than, the, than globalization. It's more important than just about anything. What is the single word that will drive the future? <laughs> even more important, <laughs> even more important than mobile. <laughs> You know what, my friends, even more important than mobile. <laughs> let me explain this one word, this one word. See, let me tell you a story. I was late for an event. It was, I was due to speak to 2,000 people in the ballroom of a hotel with 27 stories. And of course, I'm stuck at the top. I'm stuck at the top of the 27th story. I'm late for a rehearsal for an event tomorrow. And the lift isn't coming. One's broken. The other doesn't seem to work. And I'm tempted for a nanosecond as I'm stressed out, trying to get through, trying to get down. I'm tempted for a nanosecond to do something totally crazy and to touch that lift button more than once. Now, I know that you would never even think of doing such a crazy thing. Okay, put up your hands if you have thought about it. You would never do it, but you have thought about touching that lift button more than once. Come on, let's have a look. Okay. Don't worry, the video is looking in my direction. It won't catch your faces. Okay. Now, put your hands up if you actually did it. Okay. Put up your hands if you talk to the lift. Come on. Come on. Okay, put up your hands if in the last 12 months you have talked to your car. You see, I talked to 5,000, 1,000 airline pilots recently, and I discovered that every airline pilot in America talked to their planes as well. Come on, baby, it's time to go. <laughs> what we learn is that you are the most rational, logical, analytical people in the world. You spend your life st studying bits and bytes and, uh, and, and focus groups and, 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 and targeted groups and goodness knows whatever programmatic software you can get hold of and all the latest fantastic tools that Google will provide. But I know that under this surface, there is something else that's running. What is this most important word? Of course, it's emotion. It's passion. If you want to know the future of the European Union, it's to do with passion. 
if you want to know the future, what happens, let's say, with uh, uh, the refugee crisis, you think that one child whose body was discovered on the beach was not the first child that died, but it captured emotion. Policy changed, and within hours, 800,000 people were welcomed into Germany. Emotion. I'll give you another example of emotion. A 20-second event hit Japan. It caused another 20 second, a crack in a nuclear reactor. As a result of that 40 seconds of human history, 40 years of energy policy changed because in Germany and Japan both cancelled nuclear. That has had a profound effect and will affect the energy markets globally for a generation. But in the UK and in China, we had a different emotional reaction and we both pressed the boom button for nuclear. And we've both committed ourselves, both countries, to one of the largest expansions our countries have ever known in nuclear development, at the same time as Germany and Japan cancelled. Why is that? Because the future, my friend, is not driven by events, it's driven by reactions to them. And it's the same in marketing. We know that this is true, but it plays out in the area of trust as well. I suggest that one of the greatest reasons why this partner program is so important is because of the issue of trust. I face that today. The reason why I'd spent my time milking all the contacts I could find at lunchtime is I have a client who needs an agency he can really trust to deliver something fantastic for a really exciting startup that is growing 60% per year with really bad, really bad digital marketing. And it could be so brilliant. Where do I start? I start with Google Partners. Why? Because it's all about trust. I suggest to you, trust is the only thing that they sell. It's trust. It's not even based on past performance of other companies. It's that actually we'll take care of you. That we'll put our best people on your job. That we will tweak it and, and, and optimize it and we guarantee you'll get some fantastic results. And we will engineer the thinking inside your own business at the same time. So all the stakeholders really get it and we'll grow your business together. It's all about trust. Trust, you see it in banking. Without banking, without trust you have no bank, without trust you have no toy shop, without trust you have no hotel, and you certainly actually, uh, there are issues of trust too within our own uh, systems right now. I'm not, I don't know what percentage of the mouse clicks through these systems are driven by bots and, and, um, and crooks and criminals. I don't know, I have no idea. I'm not an expert in this field. I do know that there's a perception in some of the big customers that it's an issue, and this creates a challenge of trust. Now, he, the web has made us very impatient, and this is an example of emotion. I want you to imagine, last night, you flew into Dublin, you were watching a TV program, and for some particular reason, you couldn't remember how old Britney Spears was. <laughs> okay, so you, you got out your iPad, you got onto a website, and you pressed the button uh, to load. How many seconds will you wait before you press the back button? Because life's too short to wait for Britney Spears' website to load. Put your hands up if you just know that you would press the back button in a hotel room late at night in less than five seconds because life is too short to wait any longer than that. Okay. Now, what you've shown me is, you see, after, after one, by the way, a benchmark of 100,000 people in the last couple of years, and it's always the same. 95%, what it shows us is this, 95% of people in this room will terminate an online business relationship in less than five seconds. Correct? That's what you've shown me. Now, what about the generation below? By the way, two generations below, or one and a half generations below, is my, grand, my granddaughter, I don't know what her attention span is. She's 12 weeks old and she's just discovered that people live in iPads and if you touch the screen, they smile. <laughs> okay. So she's true and true, digital native. But what about, okay, the children, my children, say 25 to 30, how long are they waiting? Well, some of you are of that age group. How long is a 25-year-old waiting? Five seconds? You must be kidding. 2.5? What about, what about those of you who said, I would wait 4.5 seconds? What about you in five years' time? How long do you think you'll be waiting? I suggest much less than that. If we just keep in mind the five-second test for a moment, and it goes a bit like this. After two seconds, you think there must be a problem with the web connection in the building where you are. After three seconds, you're blaming there's something to do with the web itself, or the, uh, something else has happened. Or the, after four seconds, you are extraordinarily irritated. And after five seconds, you have lost the will to live. And as I say, you have exited. Right. So, now, why does it matter? It really, really matters because some stuff on the web is so slow. And by the way, the marketing stuff is so irritating. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm now describing as a human being. See, what about a, well, let's take uh, the example of um, transferring a campaign from 
from a desktop, as we've been talking about, right through to, the, to a mobile device. We know that if the person is at a desktop, they'll probably wait seven seconds. But if they're on the iPad, like you last night, they wait 4.5. But on the iPhone, how long will they wait? Probably only 1.2. So we got entirely different responses from the same people using different channels, which explains why it is that the campaigns we're running at the moment do so badly <laughs> in the mobile world. Because they're engineered for people with a longer time span than we've really thought about. So we need to completely rethink every aspect of the relationship. Here's another question. Uh, we live in England and where the electricity companies charge you in advance for an estimate of what they think you will use. And they usually charge us too much. So we owe, we, they owe us about a thousand pounds. So my wife is phoning them up uh, and to try and get our money back. So she presses one for accounts, press two. They get through to a robot then there's a compliance message, and then there's a ding-dong. Then the call is very important to you, please hang on. And then they start with 45 different options. And, and you can't remember them, so you have to go back and press the, the whole lot again because you can't remember what the first one was and the second one, and the other one doesn't work. Put your hands up if you find that extremely annoying when they have already stolen a 1,000 euros from you. Let's have a look at it. Okay. Put your hands up if you think it is a social crime to put in such a system, and the people who do so should be put in prison for a very long time. Now, of course, the funny thing is you can do this with uh, telco companies and IT companies and then you discover that every single one of them has systems like that in their own offices. So what happens is it's, it's kind of we have a double mind. As human beings, as ordinary human beings, we consume all kinds of media and advertising and things like that. But when we go to work, we're busy advising companies to install stuff which actually is in danger of making their customers quite annoyed and would make us annoyed at the same time. It can happen, and it's happening quite a lot, I suggest. Have a look at this list here. <laughs> okay, just, I know it's hard because this is professional stuff, but let's just imagine you're a human being. <laughs> ordinary, ordinary person, out of work, it's 11 o'clock at night, you're surfing the web, you're tired out, you've traveled across the Atlantic twice in two weeks, and you've got pop-up pages coming up across the screen. Put up your hands if you find those really annoying. Okay, uh, what about uh, paid listings? Paid listings, paid listings, I seem to spend my life clicking on a paid listing on the right-hand side of a search, which is, sounds all seductive. It sounds precisely what I'm looking for. But I get there and I find nonsense. You know, it's a trick. They take me to a site that hasn't even got the product on the page. Put your hands up if you had that and you find it also very annoying. Okay, I tell you, I tell you, <laughs> so, all right. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, this is a problem for us. It's a problem for us because, of course, it's not happening from agencies inside this room, <laughs> would it? <laughs> but I'll tell you this, it's damaging the mechanism that we need. It's damaging the channel. It's important. It's to do with trust. I need to trust that if, we, if an agency pops a link up on the right-hand side that says a particular thing, that when I waste my time pressing three seconds and waiting for another web page to load, and I scan down all the products, at least I find what I'm looking for there. It's a real page. It's a real sale. They really are. Um, what about SMS ads onto your phone? Put your hands up if you find those quite annoying. OK? Uh, what about uh, YouTube ads? YouTube ads that bear no relationship whatsoever to the video you're trying to watch. They're just interrupting your experience for how many seconds? When we said one second makes you irritated, three seconds makes you nearly lose the will to live. Fortunately, they allow you to click off before you lose the will to live, which is the five second mark, okay? But that's for some people here. What about the people who lose the will to live after 2.5 seconds because they're 10 years younger? Three seconds is a mighty long time to watch a completely irrelevant ad. Put your hands up if you agree with me. It's too long, right? <laughs> it's like a million years. So we're becoming very impatient. And what it means is we need to be think, rethinking just about every aspect of how this stuff happens. And what about autoplay videos? So there you are. Uh, you're not supposed to be looking for holidays at work, but you are. And suddenly there's a great big ding dong ding along and a great big song erupting from your computer. A video is playing and you don't know how to stop it because it's hidden down the bottom of the page, which happens you find that very irritating. Okay. <laughs> okay, what about another? Okay, yes, this is another one. This is sort of, this is media, media, you know, newspapers who are so puffed up they think that you have to give their, your email address before they allow you to read the next paragraph. Put your hands up if you find that very annoying. It's a form of theft, isn't it? It's theft of my time. You've told me that anybody who steals 10 seconds of your time should be put in prison, right? How long does it take to type in an email address and a name into a form? More than that. 
So what we're beginning to understand is that when we take our glasses off as digital marketers and we remind ourselves what it's like to be a human being, we have to confess that actually we've got quite a long way to go in terms of creating magic for the end customer, right? And actually we're going to need to do this quite quickly because what's happening is customers are rebelling. They're blocking the pop-ups, they're, they're blocking the SMSs, they're, they are, they are, they're refusing to open any kinds of emails. And they are, they are, they are, you know what's happening? When we make them angry with ads that they don't want to see, they go off the brand. <laughs> so you can have a company that's thought, that took their TV ad, just rolled it straight out onto a pre-clip on the front of a YouTube thing. It's antagonizing customers. It's actually the worst thing they could do. It's killing the brand. <laughs> Because people are thinking, what are they doing to me? They're stealing my time, three seconds of time, every time I have to watch, try to watch those videos. So it's very, very important that we get it right. And customers are talking to each other. We are part of a social network. And everything is being ranked. And in the future, your agency will be ranked. Not just by customers, by the people who pay you, but by actually the people who are watching the ads. Everything will be transparent. We will see, we will know. Everything is being commented on already. Ads are being ranked. Content is being ranked. Review reviewers themselves are being ranked. And the challenge is this, that most people in the world trust the opinion of a perfect stranger more than the website you're promoting. <laughs> that's the fact. Yeah. Put up your hands if you know that's true. They don't believe it. They're fed up with marketing and spin. We are in a post-marketing world. Put up your hands if you hate it when people market at you. Come on, show me. Be honest. But you know, well, you see, if I was doing this in any other audience, you'd see all the hands going up. <laughs> we need to listen to this. So we need to move away from the idea of marketing. I'm not sure I'm even comfortable with the word marketing anymore. I don't think it actually works for me. What does is really exciting. It's something that, which connects with everything we've been talking about today programmatic um, uh, campaigns and so on. We're changing from marketing to the conversation. A conversation which is as personal as it would be with someone who's already on social media with whom you're debating. It's talking to customers as they pass through the journey of life. It's about having a one view of that customer relationship, as we heard earlier today. It's about being, as it were, part of their, in, of their own community, being on the inside track. It's being in a privileged position where actually they're allowing you to know their world so that you can talk to them about things which matter to them at the right time, at the right place, in the right way. We heard today that most bam with this video. It's interesting, I've been tweeting to my 42,000 followers during this morning. And uh, I started, I, I was struggling to keep up with a fantastic presentation on YouTube. Who else was tweeting here doing that? I don't know. So I, it was, there was one tweet every two or three seconds to send them out. And straight away I was getting bounce back saying, hey, where do these figures come from? These are unbelievable. I said, from Google itself. Fantastic figures, extraordinary Changes happening, which I believe are leaving traditional marketing stone dead. We've learned the most bandwidth with this video, fine. I suggest to you that the only video ads worth making, if you listen to me carefully on this, you'll understand why, are ads which are perfectly crafted so that as I begin to watch the ad, I don't realise I'm watching the ad. I think I'm watching the real video. Because actually the content is so interesting. I, you know, a video on how to mend your bicycle. The video has started playing how to mend your bicycle. It's conveying to me information, something I didn't know. It's engaging me, drawing me through that particular thing and taking me straight to a site to sell bicycles or to get someone to mend it for me or whatever it is. But it's, some, it's, it's, it's not a bounce back. It's not a brand presentation. It's something that's completely in the message, in the conversation, in the mind, in the mood of the customer itself. Now, we talk a lot about big data, but big data, quite frankly, yes, it's really useful. But almost all the value, my friends, in big data is in the 2% where you'll get perhaps 95% of everything that we actually need. What I'm much more excited about, therefore, is little data, the tiny scrap which yields the crock of gold. And the greatest, uh, 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 greatest addition you can bring to your client's thinking is helping them to make sense of all the nonsense, to cut right through and to focus down on those most valuable things. Uh, but we have to be careful about this. Sometimes the little data is so precise that it could freak our customers out if they really knew what you knew about them. 
I'll give you an example. I remember advising a big company on building a website, and uh, this is a typical page, okay? So there you have a cruise being advertised, and you're watching someone typing the stuff in. And there are tools available that can watch every click that's happening, every mouse movement on the screen, without the individual even being aware that the tool has been installed. Because they've clicked to allow all kinds of things when they go onto the site, and it's there. So you're sitting there watching, and I'm, I'm watching this person on the screen, and I can see that this person has tried to enter her passport number 14 and a half times. She hasn't even pressed the send button on the form. She's on line five of a complicated form. She has 85 form entries still to go, poor thing, and she's about to give up. It's what we call struggle. You can see the mouse movements getting slower and slower and slower as, as you can sense her frustration. Now, the first thing she put in was her name, and the second thing was the mobile phone number. Moral dilemma. Advice, please. She hasn't pressed the send button. She's at her computer at the moment. I can tell she's at home. It's 7.30 in the evening. My mobile phone is here, and hers is there. This sale is worth 5,000 euros. Profit, 1,500 euros, and she's struggling. Put your hands up if you think I should phone her straight away. I've got the number there. <laughs> Put your hands up if you think, no, 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 no. You will freak her out. <laughs> okay, so we're discovering, therefore, you see, this business of the conversation of life, we have the data already. Much of it is here, but how we use it is really important. And it's all about that most important word which drives the future, which is emotion. It's about trust. It's about relationship. It's about having the permission. It's about her being aware that actually there is someone, he said, if you are happy, we will watch you as you fill in this form, and if you get into trouble, we'll pop up, and we might even give you a call. <laughs> It's, it's part of this whole different way of thinking about it. And little data can cost nothing and can release vast amounts of wealth. Let's give you a tiny example in an airline. Uh, I don't know if you've traveled across the Atlantic recently, but if you go one way from here to the US, my guess is if you're like me, the adrenaline is pumping, you're going to business meeting, you need what? You need power and web, right? And peace. You don't need champagne. You don't need a meal. Well, you need some food, but you want it on a small tray, not this business where they bring you the soup and wait 25 minutes and then bring you the main course. You want the meal where you can sit and work at the same time because the moment you get off that plane, you're into the most important presentation of your life. But when you're coming back, oh my word, you're so tired you can hardly stand. 72 hours in the US with hardly any sleep, complete jet lag. What do you need? The answer is you want a bed. Do you want a meal? No, it's only a six hour flight. I need sleep. You've had the meal already, right? You probably want a, a glass of champagne, two bottles of water, a nice bed, and please don't wake me for breakfast, right? Now, on, on a plain manifest, there's a printed list with your name on it. What's your name? Anders. Anders. So Anders' name would be printed there. And we only need one piece of information, which is completely missing, the most absurdly missing piece of information of the entire system of the airline. We need an O or an I against his name. Why? Because O means incoming, R -O, o means outgoing, I means incoming, and we need to know how many hours you've been away, right? And that will tell me, won't it, almost everything I need to know about helping you to have a fantastic, magical experience, right? How much does it cost to write a line of code to do that for British Airways? About 20 minutes of time. Have they done it? No. Why not? I cannot imagine. <laughs> Tiny data, little data, releases huge power. And little data can do that in all the kinds of marketing components that you're involved in. Touch that gold and you make an awful lot of money. Here's another example. I wonder how many times you've been in a restaurant and you've been frustrated because the waiter just won't look in your direction. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, how much does it cost to train a waiter to just look around and say... <laughs> he knows you need the bill, more wine. <laughs> a good waiter can read 40 or 50 or 60 different people simultaneously at the speed of light every 30 seconds. I'm not joking, you can do it. How much does it cost to train a waiter to use their eyes? Zero. <laughs> what does it release? It tells you it turns you into one of the best restaurants in the world. Stuff the food. But it's something about attention to detail. So what I'm saying is that we're only in the first hour of e-commerce. And what we'll need to do is to bring the kind of insights which you're seeing in the 
physical world right into digital and make it just as personal and as intimate as an environment as that. Um, and, you know, OK, we can talk about the stats and 1.5 trillion traded these days, but you know what? There's still a debate about what we should be measuring. Here's some really good news for you. This single piece of news, I'm sure some of you are already using, but is the single most important way to treble your advertising spend with particular companies overnight. What is it? It's understanding that it's nothing to do with how many new customers or sales you get. The value of the advertising budget comes from something else. The fact that these three individuals are three different people, they have three different numbers attached to them if they buy the same product. And the number is this, it's lifetime customer value. Lifetime customer value. If you've got a, a customer that's only got a, a, one of your corporate customers that's only got a short time scale, talk about three tier, three year lifetime value or five year lifetime value. And what it's basically saying is this, OK, so we make a loss on the customer in the first year because we acquire them. But the average customer stays with us for four years. Therefore, we look at four years' worth of premium, four years' worth of profit, the cost of servicing that customer, and that gives us our total four-year lifetime value. That gives us a much bigger figure, usually, than the marketing departments are willing to think about for acquiring a new customer. And if you can get them to think, even to calculate the true lifetime value, often there's a real breakthrough. Time and time and time again, I've been into a company, it could be a medium-sized or a multinational, and I say to the marketing director, say, what's your customer worth? Doesn't know. Knows the first year value, or knows you know, the first six months, or what the first thing is worth. But, yeah, but what's the lifetime relationship worth? How many other products do you sell to the average customer in four years? And what if you could improve it? What could if you improve your cross-selling by 50% with our better, better tools? What if you could turn that customer into a lifetime relationship with some of the personal conversations we're talking about? And that gives us a much, much larger figure. And that gives us maybe two or three times as much that we can justify as spending. And we know that most sales will be online. We know that uh, there's a complete fusion of online and offline. I'm not going to repeat all of that. And we know about micro moments with a very important point we heard about this morning. But I would say this, that the largest co companies that I work with only see what you're doing as a component in their bigger strategy. And they are really struggling and really need your help to understand how it fits into the rest of the world. I think it's extremely difficult for retailers right now. For a physical retailer who's got big department store costs uh, or, or, or chains on the high street, where they've got customers in the high street with the phone actually sampling their products, getting a three-hour demo, and at the same time choosing the same product from another competitor next door because Amazon will deliver it tomorrow, which is much too slow. See, the problem with online is it's very slow sometimes for reasons that we'll come to. See, we talk about home delivery. In this country, 1.3 billion packages, sorry, in the UK, in the UK, there will be 1.3 billion packages delivered to people's homes. The trouble is they're not there. What's the point of trying to deliver a product to someone's home when they're at work or they're out, and out uh, socializing or whatever? And therefore, we've seen as a next step, uh, as we've seen in Germany and across Europe, an explosion of pay and click and collect depots. But actually, that's not really the answer either. It's still terribly slow. You've told me that five seconds is like a million years. So if you're ordering a product to be delivered by click and collect tomorrow morning, that's an extremely long time, which is why warehousing is already looking rather last century. Warehousing and online don't go together very well in a world where five seconds is like a million years. Pushes us into the Uber world, a world where perhaps, let's, I'll give you a practical example. I'm running to do a speaking engagement. I've run out of the last speaking engagement, and I know that there's a problem with my power cable. I'm running back to the airport to catch another flight to go straight into another event. Yes, I'm signaling ahead that my power cable is broken, but actually, I'm also using Google. On Google, I found Apple. Apple, I've ordered the product. I've pressed the button, and an Uber car has just been dispatched. The, the Apple person has already packaged the product up. He can see the Uber car. The Uber car can see the Apple person, and they connect each other. He hands it over to the person. The person in Uber doesn't even get out of the car. He hands to the person to the Uber car. Actually, it isn't an Uber car. Uber cars are too slow. It's an Uber motorbike. The Uber motorbike can also see me, can see my phone, and is chasing me down the motorway to Dublin Airport. Overtakes me. 
flags, flags us down at the next uh, junction, window winds down, says, Uber here, here's your power supply. I said, thank you so much. You've saved my life. Goodbye. Have a good day. Uber charges my account straight away. Apple's got the, uh, got the thing. And it's the end of warehousing. So why do we need Amazon warehousing? We don't. It's too slow. And so we're going to see an explosion. It's already starting, an explosion of, of one-hour delivery, two-hour delivery through networks like all the pieces are in place already from the companies I've just mentioned and, and others that will be starting up to fill this space. An explosion of organizations looking to fulfill your retail desires in less than one hour to wherever you are because the idea of delivering at home or to the office is so last century in a mobile world. The most important thing, if you want to know how the customer feels, is to know where they are. The most important piece of little data, the most important piece of little data, in fact, the, or just about the, own, the first piece to start with, is to know where they are. If you don't know where the person is, forget it. How can you possibly market to them? I, I mean, you say, I'm, maybe, maybe you think I'm exaggerating, but I'm seriously not. Location is extremely important. At the moment, the phone company knows I'm in Google. They know I arrived in Google by plane. Why is that? Well, either the phone company or, Go or Google itself or iPhone or someone knows because they see my diary. It's all in the cloud and I've given permissions for it to be seen. So they saw that I've come, come here. They know that I lecture um, and they know my flight out. They know the flight out. They know what time my tax is coming. And actually, if anyone's got any intuitive sense, there's one time of the day they will market to me today, which is when? Not at home when I get home, but on the way to the airport after today's business is over, right? Yeah? I will be uniquely receptive at that time. Why? I'll be winding down. I won't do anything. I'm vulnerable. <laughs> tell me about a holiday. Tell me something interesting. Tell me something, tell me something I can spend money on. <laughs> but try to communicate with me now or at lunch break would have been suicidal. What a waste of time interrupting my life. So location is absolutely critical. Um, and I know you've heard that a million times before, but it really, really, really is true. And it's all part of the wearable world and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and just about everything to do with biometrics as, as well. Now, here's a fascinating thing. Now, and I, you may think that the way in which things are paid for doesn't matter to you. Actually, I think it's all part of this picture, this environment in which our whole world is transitioning. So here's, here's an interesting thing for me. So I work with a lot of tocos. And when I show them this graph, the room goes really quiet when I show it to the board of a telco. And when I show it to the board of a global bank, the same. So let me just take you through what this means and let's consider what it might mean for you. So here we have the cost of providing technology falling to zero. This is the cost of providing free technology. What's your name? Andrea. Andrea. So let's imagine that we're going to make Andrea an amazing offer. We're going to say, Andrea, we're going to give you an iPhone, iPad, whatever you want, you know, the latest Samsung device. We're going to give you, uh, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll give you one of those that is using there as well. I'll give you a free portable. I'll replace all the technology every 18 months. I'm going to give you unlimited video calls, unlimited bandwidth. I'm going to give you the biggest video package you could ever conceivably watch in 100 million years, all for free. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a second a second phone as well, so you can uh, use, use in the family. And you say, well, what's the catch? Well, this is the catch, and it really is free. Because, you see, the cost of providing all this stuff is falling towards zero. And actually, as we've discovered, nearly all the cost in terms of bandwidth is one word, one thing, which is the telcos are transmitting these days. See, the telcos, by accident, have become simply a video company. <laughs> they fell into it by mistake. They thought that they were selling voice calls, then they thought they were selling SMS. Then they thought they were selling data packages and a bit of email. No, 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 my friends. They're basically selling video. That's all they're selling. You've seen the statistics already. 65%, was it 68% of all bandwidth uh, in many, many parts of the world, especially in the European Union, will be video by 2017. What was it, 90% or 85? 80% 80 by 2019? And a big chunk of that is YouTube. 30, 40, 50% maybe YouTube alone. Whoa. So telcos have become simply video streaming providers, which is a really boring business model if you're providing handsets and everything else as well. So here's the telco, the cost of providing all this stuff falling towards zero, but at the same time, the revenue that comes from capturing every business transaction or every financial transaction is going through the roof. Because we have all the biometrics there, we have more secure technology already in your pocket than any 
branch, branch could ever possess. So the most secure way for a bank to transact is to use a mobile device. With me so far? So at this point, you start saying, OK, I'll tell you what we'll do, Andrea. If you're willing to empty, I'm not asking you today, but if you're willing to empty your handbag or your wallet or whatever it is, just take out all the pieces of plastic and just choose one. Keep one, which is an emergency, and we'll let you use it for 500 euros a month for, for just to keep you going if, I don't know, your phone battery dies or it gets stolen or something. But we really want to see everything going through our devices, our platforms, our technologies. And if we do that, we can do other things as well. You see, not only will we then be able to offer you things like insurance or pre-approved loans, or we could, we could pre-approve you for 100,000 euros of stuff already in pre-insured. We could. And we start to get all kinds of things. But the most important things, because we're fusing the telco and the bank, we know where you are. We know how you think. We know who your friends are. And what's more, we are your trusted advisor on your journey of life, because that's what this is all about. We don't want you to come into this unless you're happy for me and my team to know something about you. And Andrew might well say, well, yeah, but what about privacy? And I'd say, yes, that's fine. Turn it off whenever you want. Go, go on to private browsing whenever you want. That's absolutely fine. Turn off your location wherever you want. There's just the button to do it. That's absolutely fine. But the more you are willing to leave it open, the better the conversations will be. And, and we'll basically protect you from all marketing. I mean, marketing is dead. It's such a last century idea. What we're basically doing is that we will, we will be your concierge for marketing. So we will basically guide you on your journey of life. We know the kind of things you're interested in, and we will bring stuff to you, whether it's on the web pages, whether it's, uh, whether it's you know, through SMS, or however you like to be communicated with, actually. And, and we just think of the intelligence that we would have about my life or Andrew's life into those circumstances. Now, when I show this kind of graph, by the way, it's the complete end of telco, traditional telco. I mean, how can you sell another contract? You can't sell airtime or SMSs or data per minute or whatever. So who owns the customer relationship is my question. Who will own this customer? And by the way, when will it happen? Um, the room goes very quiet when I show this graph because everybody recognizes, every bank and every telco in the world recognizes this day will come. It's only a question of timing. And by the way, most debates about the future are not about, not about what's going to happen. That's usually obvious. Like the world's going mobile. <laughs> it's obvious. It's simply a question of timing and impact. So let's come back to this question here. I want you to give some advice to my telco and banking clients. By what year do you think that banks and telcos will find their way to fuse these kind of packages together and will be making it difficult to buy, in some places, difficult to buy a smartphone anymore because they're basically all free. When do you think this will start to happen? When do you think the first sort of telco banks, it could be someone like American Express and Google and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, you know, Bank of Ireland, whoever it is, but uh, AIB, what, what, who do you think, when do you think that would happen? Put your hands up if you think that could happen in the next 10 years somewhere. 10 years. In the next 10 years, show me quite clearly. Put your hands up if you think it could happen somewhere in the next five. My friends, it's already here. It's already here. I'm just telling you history. So the big question is, at what scale, at what impact will, will, will there be? And I suggest quite profound. Now I want to ask you another question. is Who do you think will own that customer? Who will own the Andrew, a relationship with you, Andrew? Will it be the bank? See, the bank normally sees nothing. They only see history. They only see where you were yesterday. They only see the cash that came out of the ATM this morning on the way here. They have no idea what you're doing now. They have no idea what you're thinking about. Now, whoever controls the browser knows quite a lot about you. Whoever controls your cloud, if you've allowed them permission to see, knows a lot about you. The handset provider might know a bit about you. But who do you think will own the customer? And I don't know the answer to that. It will depend on who the dominant element is in that particular partnership. And it may be that everybody owns the customer in that consortium. But it's a really, really important question. I'll tell you why. Because if you are right, and this is an inevitable process, and it's going to happen within your lifetime, in the next 50 years, and actually could be here already in some respects, if we're right, then it will profoundly change the whole nature of the way in which we talk to customers. So we're back to this business I said at the beginning, which is that marketing, just good old fashioned shouting at people, is looking really last century. And that's the whole message we've had today. It's being smarter, 
is using every piece of technology, every piece of insight we have to engineer a conversation that appears so natural, so unforced, that a person has no idea how much intelligence was behind the fact that that particular ad appeared at that very moment. But it just seemed almost intuitive, that almost spooky, and then we need to be quite careful that we don't spook people out too much, and that's the great dilemma. So, and, and that was why the relationship and permissions will be so important. Because I know that if you were to reveal as much as you know about your customers already, it would spook some of them out. I remember my, my, my wife does it searching, and sometimes she'll say, whoa, that was spooky. Whoa, that was spooky. How did they know that? <laughs> why? Because she's changed device. She's changed country. But some, and she was using someone else's computer. And suddenly, up pops an advert for the very same holiday cottage, very same holiday cottage, that she was looking at three weeks ago <laughs> at a similar time of day <laughs> and in a similar frame of mind. But she hadn't yet typed into the search engine holidays. But somehow the system knew. So that's the genius that we have. And I think it's amazing the kind of engines and intelligence that's being built right here in this room. And if there's one message, it's this, that it, we can't do it alone. This is stuff we need to work in together. And it depends on excellence. It depends on reputation and building trust, which is why the partner program is so brilliant. And in conclusion, then, I'd say, let's ex as we draw the whole day's messages together, it's this. We can expect radical changes to digital marketing. Why? Because human beings that we're marketing to are changing themselves. And it's not just that they're becoming impatient, but the whole way in which they're thinking and feeling about life is changing. Connecting with the emotions of people is becoming the number one gift and skill. It's not just... Um, it's not just the data. The history, what they've done in the past, the context, location, the time of day, the mindset they're in, these are all fundamentally important insights for us in the future. And the most, most greatest geniuses that will make the most money and become the most famous digital informers or marketers or whatever you like in the world will be those who are able to transform a marketing campaign from a company into an informal conversation that is, reveals, it gives just-in-time truth, it's authentic, full of integrity, doesn't shout, but it's just absolutely, absolutely solid and right. It doesn't oversell, but it's all about revelation. And the mobile will dominate all of that. And when we get all that right and focus on the customer experience, what it actually like, to be a human being on the end of this stuff, then we really will create some amazing customer magic. And it needn't be very expensive to do it. It's the touch of genius. It's the digital equivalent of teaching that restaurant waiter to catch someone's eye. It's the digital equivalent of suggesting to British Airways they write just one line more code to put an O or an I around your journey on the passenger manifest that does it together. And that is what it's all about. It's actually about doing it together in partnership, developing tools uh, with the feedback we just heard about this afternoon. It's really important that they engage in the conversation about building the systems and processes we need, the genius under the bonnet, to create the magic for the outside world. Thank you very much.